to think with you about the future, to think with you about the end game. What is the end result of the effort? So I'll talk about the future of the future. I apologize. I will not give you specific uh, advice on how to raise money or how to build your startup, but I will try to make you think about the future and how your startup maybe is part of that uh, future. I built my own company, I raised money, I sold my company, I took my company public. The most important thing I'm really uh, proud of is that I was a DJ for a few years. Uh, and recently, just a few years ago, I sold my company. I, all my life I was dealing with electronics and software and computers and technology, but in the last few years I switched myself a bit and I, was, I started to study biology. And I will talk a lot about biology today because I think that here in this innovation conference, in this startup uh, conference, we pay too little attention to biology. We talk a lot about electronics and software and computers and robots, but I would like you to think also a little bit, a little bit more about biology today. I'll show you that in a second. I want you to use your imagination, okay? We are talking about the future, and I want you to use your imagination. I think that innovation is all about imagination. You know, that picture, it's called the Exit, La Sortie de la Opera. It was painted uh, in the year 1800 by Robida, and the guy was trying to imagine how life will look like in 200 years. When you look at the imagination, when you look at what he was painting for us, you see that Evidently, he thought about flying cars, that everybody will be using flying cars. But everything, every detail in this photo, every detail in this picture is still old materials, still old imagination. So we have a problem. When we imagine the future, we use our current materials. And I would urge you today not to use current materials. Think about the future in future terms. Let's try to do it. Let me start with an example. What do you see over here? Well, you see technology. This is a telepresence robot. A telepresence robot will enable you in the future to attend such conferences with a device like that. So you don't need to come over here. You send your telepresence robot. That robot has a, a, an iPhone or whatever, a screen. It presents you. It takes notes. So this robot will represent you. But in conferences, in meetings, in whatever. But I want you now to use your imagination. When you see that technology, can you see Generation 2.0? Can you imagine how Generation 2.0 will look like? Use your imagination. I used mine, and here is my uh, version for Generation 2.0. And I, need to, I think that we need to realize that this is a direction that we are headed in a very fast way. Technology will stop being just a tool in our hand. Technology is not a hammer anymore. Technology is not something that I put in my pocket and that's it. The future for me is not we are going to use technology, but we are going to be integrated with technology. And I will show you that in a second. We are going to change mankind. Humanity is changing. We are integrating us and the technology. So technology is not just a muscle, not just something that you use to do things. Like, I write an email, it's an extension of my muscles. No, no, no. Think about technology as something that we integrate internally, externally. We don't use the internet. We live inside the internet, or we connect to the internet from within our body, or stuff like that. You need to look at the trends around us and realize where are they taking us. Let's start with the trend of big data and uh, artificial intelligence. The whole paradigm of computing today is changing. When I used to write software, the paradigm that I used to write software was if, then, else, if, then, else, if, then, else. You instruct the computer what to do. But think about a new generation of software, a new generation of artificial intelligence and applications using big data, that if you want to program something new, 
what you do is the following. You ask the computer to read, read a million articles on a subject, and after the computer has read a million articles on a certain subject, you start discussions with the computer. This is how you program it to be a scientist, a doctor, uh, an advisor, or whatever. This is the new generation, the new paradigm of computing. You don't need to program computers in an if-then-else paradigm. What you can do, you can discuss a lot of information with the computer. I'll show you that later on. So this is one trend that we should all be aware of. The other trend that we should all be aware of, I, I hinted at before, is synthetic biology. I don't know how many of you know it already, but we are able today to program life. Life is a programmable platform. We are able to create, change, modify, modify DNA. We are able to create new bacteria. We are able to program bacteria. So this is becoming, when I look around me right now, I see several hundred electronic computers in front of me and several hundred of biological computers in front of me. And those two platforms today don't really connect. They will connect. And this is the big change that I expect for the next few years. We will connect the platforms. So I'm returning to my basic question. What is the end game? Where are we going to? And it was Craig Venter who said something, I think, which is extremely powerful. He said, the biological and the electronic worlds, the biological and the digital worlds, are becoming interchangeable. Interchangeable is a very strong word. Think about it. Next day, I will be able to write electronic code on a biological platform, and I will be able to write biological code on a, an electronic platform. I will be able to run some of your personality in a computer. I will be able to interact and interchange between things. We are moving in a direction of integration of the carbon and the silicon. The carbon is one platform, and the silicon is another platform, and we are interchanging those uh, platforms. I truly believe, and this is the best way I can say it, that we are about to see the creation of Homo sapiens 2.0. And Homo sapiens 2.0 is the next evolutionary version of Homo sapiens. The Homo sapiens 2.0 will be a combination of humanity as we see it today and the technology that we have created. And I know that the moment you put it this way, people feel bad about it. People are afraid of this future. People see it as a negative future. And I will try also today to convince you that this is a wonderful future. At least it can be. It can be a wonderful future. It can be a very positive future. The combination of what is human today, the technology that we have created in Homo sapiens 2.0. What is amazing to see is that we have a history. We have a history of 14 billion years on, you know, in, in this universe. And it took billions of years to prepare the stars. And it took hundreds of millions of years to prepare Earth. And it took millions of years to reach Homo sapiens. And now, in the last 250 years, last two, which is nothing, it's really nothing in terms of time, last 250 years, we are now going for the next generation, Homo sapiens 2.0, which is the combination. Now, if you allow me, what I'd like to do now is stop talking about the future and share with you the present. Because I believe that if we share the present, if we look at the present uh, together, you will have the same view about the future that I have. And I'm going to devote the next 10, 15 minutes to showing to you the technologies that we have today in the labs, in, in uh, everywhere, we have in the universities, we have these technologies, and those technologies, once you look at all of them together, you actually see a new picture of, of the future. And I would urge you, each one of you, to look at those technologies and see 
where is my startup in this picture? What am I doing? Am I doing the right things? I mean, am I really looking at the big issues? Am I solving the big real problems? Am I preparing myself to the future of technology in two, three, five years? You know, as a startup uh, entrepreneur, you can make two mistakes. You can be too late to the market and you can be too early to the market. You really need to find the right window of opportunity of what you are doing. And I, I have seen too many startups that have made a very simple mistake. They didn't allow themselves to think about the technology and the market in three to five years. They didn't allow... Let me share with you one mistake that I made as, as, a, as an entrepreneur. I developed a very small key. One of my products in my previous company was a very small key. That very small key was used to protect software against illegal use. That was the product. It has a little piece of memory inside. So think about it. A USB key with a, a memory piece inside it, protecting software against illegal use, and you had this key, and you can use it, and use it to connect it to the USB port. And what was the mistake that I made at that time? I didn't see the market developing in terms of memory cost, memory size, flash memory. And if I was a bit more looking into the future and allowing myself to say, oh, I have a key with little memory, what if I put a lot of memory on that key in two years, in three years, in five years, that could have been the flash drive. That could have been the disk on key. That could have been the key that everybody is using today, the USB key to transfer files from one place to another. But when I looked at my key, I said, to put a lot of memory on that device, it will be hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's so expensive. In two to three years, it became dozens of dollars. So I would urge you today, not just to think about the future in general, I would urge you to make sure that your technological vision is updated three years ahead, that you know what are the trends, how the market is going to change, and that you are ready for it. But again, let's go to, uh, to, the, um, to the present, and allow me to quickly scan with you current technologies that are changing our universe completely. I will start with robots. I prepared four robot stories for you. Story number one, Curiosity, you see on the upper left side. Uh, where is Curiosity right now? You know where Curiosity is right now, right? Curiosity is on Mars. Curiosity is preparing uh, Mars, preparing our, no our knowledge for future human uh, colonization, future human settlements on Mars. Allow me to give you uh, a prediction. In 2025 20, years, we are going to see people on Mars. And this is extremely important. We need to see people on Mars because right now, humanity has no backup. And I think that the most important thing for humanity for the next 25 years is to make sure that we create backup for humanity, probably on Mars, to start with. Now, curiosity, let's get used to the idea that robots are now becoming our uh, first explorers. They always go ahead of us. They are our pioneers, um, and this is step number one. If you look at the robot on the uh, uh, left side, on the bottom left side, you see Big Dog. Big Dog is a military robot. Actually, uh, Big Dog can carry 150 kilograms of weight on his shoulders and run after a platoon of uh, soldiers. I, I cannot do that. I think that you need to be quite intelligent to be able to follow soldiers with so much weight uh, on your back in the snow. And we're going to see more and more robots like that. You all know who is the owner of Big Dog right now. You know who is the owner of Big Dog? Just uh, a thought, Google. Google has acquired more than nine robotic companies in the last two years. Uh, they also acquired other companies, but Google is making big steps along this vision of becoming a future company with robots, with uh, 3D printing, with biology, we can discuss it uh, later on. 
The robot on the uh, upper right side is called X47B. X47B is actually a nightmare for me. It's a nightmare because it's the closest thing to an unmanned, autonomic, shooting, killing robot. X47B is the next generation of combat uh, uh, planes for the U.S. Army. It is going to replace F-35. Now, F-35 is defined as the last plane, combat plane, that a carbon-based pilot can be put in the, um, in the plane. This one has no place for a pilot. This one, do you know that even today, most of the U.S. combat pilots, they don't sit inside their plane. Two-thirds of them are sitting in their offices, in their air-conditioned offices, and this is where they ply their planes for. But with the next version, there's no option to put a pilot inside. Now, this is just the beginning. If I'm telling you that we have no option to put a pilot inside, what is next? And who is next? Can you think about the future uh, jobs or the future occupations or the future... What are, we, what are we going to do? I have some good news for you. It will not take long time before everybody here will not have a job. Uh, you know, people, people hate me when I say it. People hate me when I say it, but technology as a whole, what are we doing? We, are, we need to get used to the idea that we don't need human workers. We, we have some kind of uh, illusion that once in our past, we were all peasants doing agriculture. And the agriculture guys were replaced by the industry guide. And the industry guys were replaced by the service guys. And the service guys will be replaced by something. And what if there is no something? What if we create computers and software and robots and technology that actually we don't need pilots? But it's not just pilots that we don't need. We don't need pilots. We don't need medical doctors. We don't need bankers. We don't need them. Who do we need? You know what? I will allow myself to compliment the audience here. I think that there is still a window. There is still a window for innovation and entrepreneurship. This is the only window that will survive. A window for entrepreneurship, a window for... Because we don't need somebody to go to work. We have other stuff that we are developing to go to work for us. We'll get it uh, further. Well, the next robot over here, I cannot give you too many details about uh, that robot right now. Um, I can mention uh, her name. Her name is Roxy. Uh, if you need more information, approach me after uh, the talk. I can give you the uh, website, etc. Uh, I can tell you that Roxy is less than $10,000. I can also tell you here that Roxy um, has um, a switch with uh, five uh, states. Uh, z zero is completely quiet, and you can play with it. The last thing I can tell you is that Roxy has three engines. Okay? three engines. Uh, Roxy has a male version. The male version of, uh, sorry girls, the male version of Roxy has only one engine. Okay? If you want more details, come to me later on. But now, seriously, I would make a prediction. I would make a prediction that in several dozens of years, we will see families, intimacy, romance, relationship between computers, software, robots, and people. We will see that. Good news, bad news, I don't know, but we are heading in this, uh, this direction. So, we gave you, I gave you some um, robot stories. Let's talk about the next technology. Let's talk about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is changing everything we know about computing, about computing power. I'm sure that everybody has seen Watson. Watson, for me, is an amazing story. 
You know, IBM have this uh, need every few years. They need to challenge computing and humanity. So IBM did it with chess, and they won the chess competition a few years ago. And the recent challenge IBM took upon themselves was to win Jeopardy, to win um, uh, that game. The, the competition is quite simple. You compete on a stage. Uh, the, the computer over here had to switch the button like everybody else, and the computer is not connected to the Internet. And you are asked questions that, trust me, a simple Google search doesn't solve. So I ask you a question, general knowledge. Google search will not solve it. And Watson became the world number one champion for um, Jeopardy with the ability to analyze language, to analyze information, and to give answers and to justify the answers. When the IBM engineers were asked, what is Watson going to be next? I mean, after he achieved that, what is going to do next? The answer was very interesting. They said, Watson is going to help medical doctors take decisions. Now, you are an intelligent audience. Can you translate that statement for me to simple English? What is Watson is about to help medical doctors to take decisions? The way I see it, what they meant and what is going to be, Watson is going to replace medical doctors. It will not take long before nobody here will dare to go to a carbon-based medical doctor. There are two reasons for that. Reason number one, they cannot really be fully up to date. Medical doctors today cannot read all what they need to read. They don't read all the articles. They don't get all the news. They don't know everything, unfortunately. And the second reason why carbon-based medical doctors will not be able to do the job in the future is the fact that medical doctors don't really connect to you, to your body. They don't really know what's going on in you. A computer will be able to analyze so much information, DNA-wise, um, biology-wise, chemistry-wise. A computer will be much more connected to you real-time. The computer will use this real-time knowledge to provide you with personalized medicine. So, if you want me to imagine the future doctor, the future doctor is a combination of sensors, information, tiny medical robots inside our body, and a big artificial intelligent, an intelligence uh, machine, a big computer, analyzing and taking decisions. And it will not take a hundred years. It will take way, way less than a hundred years. My prediction? In 10 to 15 years, we will be using less and less medical doctors. So that's the future of AI. Um, here you see, by the way, some uh, vision created by uh, IBM, uh, again, about this future network, because it's not just AI, it's also the network. The fact that we connect everything, we connect intelligent devices with people in the same network, we will not distinguish between people and other intelligent devices in our networks. Let me see if I can uh, run a short, um, in a second, let me see if I can sh run a short video for you. Listen carefully to what the guys are saying. It's the first time that a big computing company is not afraid to say that computers are thinking, that computers, machines think. I truly believe that machines think maybe in a different way to humans, but they think. And they think better and better and better. In some ways, they already uh, suppressed humanity. Let's see if you have a keyboard, if you can press enter or something, and you can see the video. Let's try. If it works, fine. If not, we'll skip it. No, that's the next slide. Click on the... you can? You need a keyboard? Oh, that's it. And is there audio? Oh, quick time, forget it. I would recommend that you go all search for uh, Watson. One interesting thing, Watson today is also available as an API for your smartphone. So you can actually, from every smartphone, you can access through an API that artificial intelligence, and the next generation of any application 
we will also be connected and using artificial uh, intelligence. So we spoke about robots, we spoke about artificial intelligence. Let's talk a bit about 3D printing. 3D printing is changing in my eyes everything we know about our current reality. Now, we all think of 3D printing as, you know, the model thing, as the small toy, a toy I use to print little models. Now, this is the history of 3D printing. Today, you can use 3D printing to print engines, to print real stuff. We know how to use over 350 different materials to print in three dimension. We also know how to use organic materials to print body organs. Now think about it. It's one step again in this direction. We will be able to print more and more body organs. We will be able to print parts of ourselves, and we will be able to integrate. We are going to have some very interesting questions in the future, like, if I'm able to generate a heart which is better than the original heart, at what age mothers will have a dilemma should I remain, should I keep the old, my, my uh, baby's heart, the original one, that was planned for 70 years, 80 years, 100 years, with the one which is suitable for 200 years? Should I take it now? Should I do it now? What organs should I replace? So technology will open a lot of other dilemmas, but we should be uh, really uh, getting ready for that. We can print organs, we can print engines, we can print demos, we can print buildings. I know that some of you, after I told them that there are going to be no doctors in the future and no pilots in the future, maybe said, okay, we'll become, uh, we'll go and build buildings, we'll become, you know, I have another you know, piece of bad news for you. We don't need people to build buildings. It's good news. We don't need people to build. What we should do, we should take the, the architect plans or the computer plans, feed them, to an XYZ robot so simple that will build the building. We don't need physical workers. I think that the greatest challenge of our generation and the, gen the next generation is to create meaning without work. Too much our generation, my generation, what you do, your job, is your identity. We are now going to a new generation that you cannot define your identity by, your, uh, by what you do. You'll have to find other meanings for life. And this is the greatest ch uh, challenge, if you ask me, of the next uh, generation. So this is um, 3D printing. The next technology I'd like to address is transportation. Uh, everything we know about transportation is about to change. This is the uh, Tesla car, the electric car made by uh, Tesla. I really would like to drive a car uh, like that. All the other cars I saw so far, the electric cars were not so nice. But electric cars are just one small thing of the big change in transportation. Everything we know about transportation will change. Let me start with the flying car, okay? Those of you who are waiting for the flying car, here it is. It's not so expensive. There is a flying car to buy today. The problem with the flying car is that if you want to use it, you need a driver license and you need a flight license, okay? And it's not so easy for us. So who is going to be the best drivers of the flying cars? The robots, the computers. It's amazing to see that we are now creating a set of technology to be used by technology. And yes, we will all be using flying cars in the future, but probably we will not be driving them. The computer will be driving this car for us. This is more realistic. This is today the autonomous car. This is the Google autonomous car. Um, it is being used already today. Just a few days ago, two days ago, in Nevada, in the US, they passed a law that allows trucks to be, autonomous trucks to be used uh, uh, on, on the roads. So we are going in this direction. And let me give you a prediction about human driving. I would predict that in 15 years, if somebody here wants to drive a car, he will have to do the, the, the following. Wear a helmet, sign uh, a life uh, waiver agreement, and then he will be put in some remote place 
to do circles and drive, but we will not be driving our cars in streets. You know why? Because we are really bad drivers. We kill over one million people a year in car accidents every year. 1.2 million people die in car accidents every year. We should not be driving cars. So computers will be driving our cars. You see the first generation over here, and uh, it will not take long. It will not take long because we, are, we should do it as soon as possible. The next generation will never understand how we allowed ourselves to drive. This is so uh, uh, dangerous. Before we see uh, all these uh, big changes, uh, there is another trend that you're going to see over here, which is V2V, vehicle to vehicle. We will create, I mean, we will connect our vehicles all together to create some kind of uh, swarms. Uh, cars will be talking to other cars. If you, go, if you want to go from here to Paris, you will enter the route to Paris, and uh, you will be communicating with other cars on the way to Paris. Once you get to Paris, you can disconnect yourself and do whatever you want uh, to do. So this, is, this will be an intermediate stage uh, before we go to fully autonomous cars. By the way, when we change to autonomous cars, our life will be changed completely. 40% of the area of Los Angeles is devoted to cars, transportation, parking. So you don't need so much car uh, parking and cars, whatever, when, whenever you want to go from one place to another, you use uh, your uh, device, you get your own office, your own bedroom, your own car, your own whatever, and it takes you from one place to another. And if you want to go ten people or five people or two people, you get the proper car for you. And it will be totally ch it changed. But people are also telling me that once we have um, uh, 3D printers, we will not need cars because there's no reason to go to shop or to buy. You can always print your reality uh, locally. Anyway, so this is transportation. One more piece of transportation. Uh, this is um, uh, a new uh, vision by uh, Elon Musk to create a train, an, uh, a tube train, that can go 4,000 miles an hour. Think about how the universe will look, how the, how the world will look when we connect Los Angeles and New York, Paris, London, Vilnius with a train that goes 4,000 miles an hour. Now, first of all, you don't need to go out because you can print everything, but if you go out, you can do it very fast. At this point, I'm offering beer, a virtual one, uh, because people need it, I know. I'm trying to be optimistic about the future, am I truly optimistic? But the more I talk, I see people nervous, because we don't like change. We don't like change. But I'll give you one positive advice. I'll give you one... What makes me optimistic about the future is the fact that I know that we live today in the best times ever. Never. We had such a wonderful period of time. Yes, we have problems. Yes, we have challenges. Yes, we have issues. But this is the best time ever. I don't want to go 50 years back. I don't want to go 100, 200, 500, 500. I don't want to go back. I don't know if you want to go back. So I'm looking forward to the future, and I think that uh, it will be wonderful. I was talking about transportation, I was talking about computers, about robots, about artificial intelligence, about 3D printing. But you know what? This is the simple stuff. This is really not so exciting. This is happening. What is really happening today, and it is exciting, is what happens in synthetic biology. What happens with life itself. We learn how to program life, and I'm going to show you a few technologies over here which are quite amazing. The first technology over here on the, on the upper uh, left side, synthetic life, it looks, it looks like uh, grapes, but it's not grapes. These are bacteria, and that bacteria is very unique. It was actually programmed by people and computer. 
It's programmed life. What Craig Venter has done here, he engineered a long DNA molecule from chemicals, and after he synthesized that long molecule from chemicals, he inserted this new DNA in a dead envelope of another bacteria, boosted it, and he got a new creature, a new bacteria alive. I think this is the most amazing thing technology has created in the last 100 years. It changes everything we know about life and our ability to interact with life. It now makes life a platform for innovation, for computing, for integration. And this is what is happening here. Um, one bacteria which is being designed right now is um, it's a, it's a product, it's a bacteria, it's a living product that will go on top of mountains, uh, trash mountains, eat the mountain, go to the other side and pee whatever uh, lead. So you take the mountain, you eat it, and you generate lead on the side. Or you uh, swim in the ocean, you eat pollution, you go to the side and you generate oil. So this is a very functional device. But this is just 1.0, this is just the beginning. Think about what we can do when we program life, when we create applications, not just in computers, but also living applications. The uh, one on the right side, on, on the upper side, is what you may call a cyborg tissue. It's a tissue which is combined of biological tissue and very thin electrical lines. I can actually combine at the tissue level electronics and biology. The applications are, I mean, think about one application I, I was thinking of is what if I implement very thin lines in your retina, in your eye, so when you look at something, you don't need to take your uh, camera to create an image. You look at something and you automatically translate the photo to Facebook or Instagram or whatever directly from your eyes, if we are able to combine uh, at that uh, level. But the applications here are mindless. Another amazing technology over here, nanomedicine, nanorobots, we know now how to program small biological computers. I want you to imagine a teaspoon with some water inside. You take this teaspoon and you swallow three million small computers into your body. And now these small computers are circulating in your blood, in your body, in your cells. If, if it's easier for you, call it medicine, okay? But this these are computers. I can program them. Weak computers, but I can take plenty of these computers and insert them into my body. Metaphorically, I can say that we will connect to the Internet from within. Our organs will be connected to the Internet. So that's another integration uh, that we see today uh, happening at the nano uh, level. The integration between people and computer will be done on many levels. We are going to see more and more applications like the Google Glass. We are going to see more and more applications like computers being able to understand or read emotions or analyze behavior. Uh, I think that it will not take long before a computer will be able to look at you and to know so many things about you you cannot even imagine. Um, it will know your age. It will know your... Uh, so many things. It will know how you feel. It will communicate with you in an emotional level, once understanding, reading you in a, in a much better way. Uh, another field of integration is going to be with small sensors. We are able today to manufacture really small sensors, really cheap sensors that do not require a battery, and that sensor will connect to the Internet. So everything, every device, everything here, will be connected with these sensors to the Internet and provide us with more information. Uh, I'm always telling people that when you have an Apple, 
at the edge of the apple, you have a small uh, something. What's the application for, for that small something at the edge of the apple? Why do you need it? You need it to put a sensor. So right now, this computer, this apple, every apple can be connected to the internet. Why do you want to connect an apple to the internet? I don't know, but we will. We will connect our apples to the internet. Another field of technology which is really being exploding these days is brain research. We are achieving amazing results with uh, brain research. And I can tell you that the scientists are always very shy and careful about what they do and how they present it. But we are using our digital technology and computers now to study our own brains. And we are getting forward. There is a huge European project for brain um, emulation and brain research. Going now, the biggest one is going now in Europe. But there are brain research projects everywhere. And I do believe that this is going to be the next uh, field of uh, breakthroughs. The film here that I will not be able to show you, but I urge you to go and search it on the internet. This is an experiment done at Berkeley University. And at Berkeley University, they connected less than 50 electrodes to your, uh, to your brain, to your uh, skull. And with these electrodes, they were able to ex extract a certain picture, a certain image from your mind. So what you will be able to see on the video on the internet, if you look for it, Berkeley, is on the left side, it's a video they show the guy. And on the right side, it's the image they take from his mind, from his brain. And this is amazing. I mean, it's still very low resolution, but when I looked at it, I was stunned for a few, for a few minutes. Our ability to read the brain, read thoughts or whatever. Theoretically, we can think about one day going to sleep, walking up in the morning, with a DVD of our uh, dreams, or whatever. We are making a lot of progress uh, in this direction. So at this point, I'd like to stop again for a second and ask you the question. What do you think is the end game? Where are we going to? It's really fun to come over here and invent the next application, the next iPhone thing, the next whatever, but look at the full picture. Where are we going to? What is the full picture? And it's happening very fast. So some people have tried to give us some answers about that. One of the answers was given by the futurist uh, Ray Kurzweil. And Ray Kurzweil is telling us that in a very near future, 2045, we are going to reach what he defines as the singularity point. And what is the singularity point? It's a point in time in which computers, software, and technology are more intelligent than people, much more intelligent than people. But the good news, we also now live forever. Medicine is so advanced, computing is so advanced, technology is so advanced that we don't die anymore. Honestly, personally, I don't fully connect to that, uh, to that vision. I don't think that in a few years we will reach immortality. But I am almost certain that we are going to live much longer. It's not we are going to live much longer, we are already living much longer. I think that our kids will not be shy to say, um, I'm 150, I'm 200 years old. I think that we are going step by step to make our health, to make um, our being much more uh, healthy and uh, eventually reach longer life. The key to achieving such long lives is quality of lives. The issue is not just to maintain us alive. The issue is to make sure that we improve quality of life with technology, with science, with education, so that eventually we can live uh, much longer and much uh, happier. So I'm going to show you the new uh, 80 is the new uh, 20. Um, and that's my image of next generation getting old. You know, 
there is a personal story I can tell you here. I'm uh, a bit uh, above uh, 50 today. And if I personally, 50 years old, 50 years old, if I personally lived in London a hundred years ago, today I was one year statistically dead. Life expectancy in London a hundred years ago for people, for men like me, was 49 years. The fact that I feel that I have a full life ahead of me is amazing, is amazing. We doubled, more than almost doubled, life expectancy in the last hundred years. So I have a question for you. How much will we double, will we triple, will we extend life expectancy in the next 100 years? And I think that we are going in a very uh, positive uh, direction here. So 80 is the new uh, 20. I'd like to raise a point here. When you look, in your opinion, what is the number one parameter that sets, affects your life expectancy? What determines? What one number will probably determine your life expectancy? Your genes. Your genes is a very good answer, but I have another answer, okay? I, I hope it's not a, too big of a shock for you, but usually what sets your life expectancy is money. The richer you are, the longer you live, on average. The richer you are. Rich countries have long life expectancy. Poor countries have shorter life expectancy. And, and I'd like to use this point to raise an issue here. I was talking about a wonderful future, a future of technology, a future of abundance, a future of health, a future of people living long lives, flying cars. The point is that the future is not distributed evenly before. And there is one parameter which is critical here. The richer the country is, the, uh, the more they would expect to enjoy from what I'm describing right now. I'd like to address that point a bit more in, in a few minutes. So, by the way, you can see over here that life expectancy is going up and up and up, but you can also see that today, the highest life expectancy you can find on Earth right now is in Monaco. And you understand why. You understand why. Let's see how we address it later on. So, it's not just technology, and I'm about to finish in a few uh, minutes. It's not just technology, it's not just science, it's not just innovation or engineering. The whole economy is going under a significant change. I was born in an age of shortage. Law number one of economics used to be the law of shortage. We will always be short of things, we will always want more. But with technology, with innovation, with the startups, we are creating a new economy. We are creating an economy of abundance. Computers and software and robots. I mean, think about, I wake up in the morning, I get my energy from the sun, the energy is being used to generate whatever I need, and it's an age of abundance. It's an age of, not shortage, but abundance. We don't need to work. The real challenge of this age of abundance is going to be different from what we know so far. We had to go to work, we had to work hard to generate resources. In this new age, resources are being generated. So the only main question that remains to be solved is how those resources are being distributed. And we have a challenge here. We have a real challenge here to... When I was younger, I was naive, and I believed that technology closes gaps between people. If you bring technology, you close gaps between people. Today, what I realized is that technology opens gaps. The first guy to have access to resources and technology open gaps which are very hard to close. So this is the real challenge for us right now. We are going to live in an age of abundance, and the question is, in, in, this, in this age, 
the resources are much more important than the work that you do. By the way, uh, abundance also comes in numbers. If I ask you a question right now, what is the average GDP per person worldwide today, I'm almost convinced that you gave me a very low number. We still believe that we live in shortage, in big shortage. But the amazing truth is today, it's around $12,000 a year on average, including Asia, including Africa, including, including Europe and the US, $12,000 a year, the average GDP per person. And you look at the graph, we are generating abundance. We are generating more and more. So again, the real question is, how you, do you distribute that abundance? I'm going to finish with two challenges, because I gave you some kind of uh, optimistic view of great stuff in the future, but I'm going to be very specific about two challenges that I think we have the responsibility to look at. The first one is the issue of social gaps. Yes, we are creating abundance. Yes, yes, we have more and more and more, but at the same time, gaps are becoming larger and larger and larger. And we have the responsibility to address that. Not everybody will reach the future. Not everybody. I believe that we as humans would like to make sure that most of us have the chance to reach the future, and we have to address those gaps. The other challenge we must address is Earth itself. Again, I'm optimistic. I think that technology will solve everything, but we might be abusing our Earth a bit too much. If today, if today five billion Asians and Africans would like to live with the same quality of life, same standard of living as 500 million Europeans and Americans, we need today six planets to enable that. And I counted, we don't have six planets. We have one planet Earth, and we will have Mars, but we don't have six. So we, are, we might be abusing our growth a bit too much, and we might change it a bit too fast and create some real damage. So that's my second real uh, call, uh, that we should be watching you know, uh, the ecology, watching the environment a bit, a bit more to prevent that uh, disaster. I'm going to finish with an optimistic look for the future and a plan to make sure that humanity reaches uh, the future. In my plan, there are five simple uh, steps. Step number one, we have to continue tech innovation. Tech innovation, technology, is the solution, if you ask me. This is how we grow the cake. This is how we create abundance. We need to, whatever we are doing here is extremely important because we are enabling much more for everybody. But at the same time, we should invest much more in ecological innovation, in the environment uh, innovation, because we are putting Earth on risk. And we should invest much more in social innovation, in closing the gaps, in taking responsibility. And personally, I believe that if we don't do tech innovation, ecological innovation and social innovation, we will fail. It will not work. We should also continue with the great trend of 2.5 to 2.1, what? 2.5 to 2.1? Kids, children per woman. It's a great trend. I mean, only 50 years ago, an average woman on Earth had around five kids. The number today is 2.4, and it's going down. Once we reach 2.1, it's great. And the last phase in my plan is, yes, we should go to planet Mars. It is important. This is part of, uh, uh, of the plan. If this plan is too complicated for you, and you feel it's too much to do in one morning, I have uh, prepared a simple version for you. We should make the cake bigger. This is tech innovation. We should slice the cake differently. This is social innovation. And we should eat less. This is ecological uh, innovation. As simple as that. But we have to do all the three. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to finish with one slide, which is unrelated. Maybe it is related. 
I act as the chairman of uh, an amazing project called Space IL. We are going to the moon. We are building a spaceship to go to the moon. Uh, the long-term plan is to go to Mars, but we need to go to the moon first. So join us, and hopefully in about two and a half years, uh, we will be able to land a spaceship on the moon. If you want to join, it's very easy. You approach us on Facebook, you send your photo, and we take your photo in a hard disk to the moon, free of charge. Now, this is the closest thing I can guarantee to you as eternity. I can give you my own personal guarantee that we will keep your photo on the moon for the next 11 million years. So, send us your photos, and thank you very much.